Life Audio. Hey there, Heather Creekmore here. I'm glad you're listening to the Compared to Who show today. Today, we're going to talk about what to do if there's a part of your body that you hate. Specifically, we're talking about if you hate your stomach, but you can apply this to any part of your body that you have been obsessing over trying to change. First, no, you're not alone. Most people have one, but I hope to give you some truth and encouragement today so you will not stay stuck there. And hey, speaking of stuck, did you know that I do coaching with individual women one-on-one? Coaching is a great opportunity to get customized help for your body image issues. So check out the coaching tab on compareto.me to learn more. Welcome to Compared to Who, the podcast to help you make peace with your body so you can savor God's rest and feel his love. If you're tired of fighting body image the world's way, Compared to Who is the show for you. You've likely heard lots of talk about loving your body, but my goal is different. Striving to fall in love with stretch marks and cellulite is a little silly to me. Instead, I want to encourage you and remind you with the truth of scripture that you are seen, you are known, and you are loved no matter what your size or shape. Here, the pressure is off. If you're looking for real talk, biblical encouragement, and regular reminders that God loves you and you're not alone, you've come to the right place. I hope you enjoy today's show and hey, tell a friend about it. Well, hey there, friend. I'm so glad that you're joining us on today's show. So our topic, what to do if you hate your stomach. Now, I've been coaching women for, um, Almost a decade now. And this is something that comes up over and again. I talk to women about this specific body part, their stomach. Actually, I talk to women about stomachs more than I talk to them about thighs or butts or noses or anything. We talk about their stomach. And you know, I'll be honest with you, I've never really had stomach issues. That was never really the part that I struggled with until recently. So I'm a pear shape, always been a pear shape, always gained my weight from the waist down, (laughs) never around my waist or the waist up. But as I'm aging, things are changing. And I'll talk more about that in just a minute. But I want to kind of share with you like why I'm doing this episode today. So I want to start off just by rooting us and grounding us in some scripture. And I'm going to apply it more later, but I just I just want to start with scripture. And the scripture I want to ground us with today is Philippians 319. And I'm going to read it from the, I believe it's the New International Version. It goes like this: Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their God is their stomach. That's a fascinating concept. I honestly think it's better translated appetite, and it is translated appetite in in many different translations, but we're going to talk about that in just a minute. I think as we kind of start off this conversation about our stomachs, about our stomachs, or, or really any body part that we get hung up on, we have to start by asking ourselves a fundamental question. Is this becoming an idol to me, right? So another word for idol would be God, little g, God, not big g, God. But is it becoming so important to me that it is shaping the way I think about my life? It's shaping my heart. It's shaping my opinions. It's consuming my thoughts. And that, my friends, is body image idolatry to a very specific extent, right? When our God becomes our stomach. So we're going to get back to that in just a minute because I've got three things I want you to remember today. But first, let me give just a little bit of background, okay? So like I said, stomachs have really been my big hang up, but I am approaching 50 now and my whole physique is changing for many reasons. I'm also coming out of an eating disorder that I didn't even know I had and I'm starting to eat intuitively and that's changing, I think, in part the way I look. But I think more of my issues are surrounding my age. But I was 
getting out of the shower the other day and I didn't have contacts in or glasses on and I normally don't look in the mirror. I just think it's best for women who struggle with body image issues not to spend too much time focusing on the mirror. Not because we need to be ashamed of what we see, but just because it sets our focus in the wrong place. I've never met a woman with body image issues who spent a ton of time with the mirror and then suddenly felt better afterwards. I think it puts our eyes on ourselves instead of putting our eyes on Jesus or a what purpose we have in this life, and it just kind of sends us in a downward spiral. But on this day, I decided to sneak a peek. Yep, I took a look. Now, praise God, I didn't have any corrective lenses on, (laughs) because I think that helped me mentally. But as I looked in the mirror, I saw the shape of a woman that I didn't recognize. Maybe some of you can relate. I was like, who is that person? And I, I really was thrown off for a little bit. Now, candidly, like I've been dealing with my body image issues for a decade now, and God has done a great work in my heart. I would be lying if I said it didn't bother me, <laughs> but praise God, I do have the resources. I have the toolkit to know how to handle it. And so I was able to talk myself down from that ledge fairly quickly. But then it got me thinking, like, what would one of my clients or someone who should be my client, (laughs) perhaps, what would they do? What would my average listener do after seeing herself in the mirror, being surprised by her new shape? And for me, it was being surprised that I had a stomach, (laughs) that I was rounder than I've ever been before. I was normally more pear shaped, but this this body looked like an apple. Um, What would my listener do? And so I figured, I don't know, I'm guessing for you here, but I think you'd Google it, right? How do I flatten my stomach? What do I do if I hate my stomach? How can I change my stomach? And so that's what I did. I put it into Google to find my fix. And oh my goodness, friend, I I don't remember how many million articles there were that told me how I could change my stomach. (laughs) But I stopped reading after eight or nine because they were pretty much all the same. Let me tell you what I learned. I learned that, first of all, we treat fixing, and I'm using quotation marks around that, we treat fixing a body part that we don't like, like our stomachs, like a project, like you can fix the broken pipes in your kitchen, you can fix this broken part of your car, and similarly, you can fix this part of your body you don't like. But friends, I wonder if that's actually true. I mean, my story, I was a fitness instructor for a long time and women would always come to me with parts of their body they didn't like or parts of their body they wanted to work on. And we were always told you can't spot train. You can't just, you know, do something that will change just one body part. Like body parts are determined by genetics and lots of other things. So we don't have complete power to just change that one part that we don't like. Sure, there are some things that we may be able to do that may adjust the way we look. But the way these articles phrased it made it seem like I could just follow the five easy steps and boom, I would have a stomach I loved by summertime. Isn't that what they promise? But is it true? So let me tell you what the steps were that I found. I found steps like eat Right. Well, that's a shocker. (laughs) Of course, the ironic thing is eating right varied from article to article, right? Some articles said no carbs. Some articles said you must have some carbs. I mean, there's no consensus around this. And as we all know, if you've been listening to the show for any amount of time, you know how I feel about the schizophrenic ride that diet culture has taken us on where one year, one food is the, you know, prized possession. And then the next year, that food is something no one can eat because it will make you fat. Like maybe you remember in the 80s and 90s, like I do eating plain bagels and special K thinking that's what would make us all thin. Now how preposterous that sounds now, right? But that's the kind of ride diet culture has had us on. So even terms like eating right are 
ambiguous and it really kind of can be frustrating as well. And then said to exercise, right? Well, of course we need to exercise. Like, you know, that that seems like a no brainer. If you want to fix your stomach, well, then shouldn't you be doing crunches and core work and all these things, right? But the reality is you can't spot train. So believing that you can do enough crunches to get the belly of your dreams is a little unrealistic too. I'll be right back with the other recommendations I found for what to do if you hate your stomach in just a minute. So as I was going through all of these articles about what to do if you hate your stomach, the focus was pretty clear. If you hate your stomach, you should change your stomach. So like I said, the first one was watch how you eat. And that'll change your stomach. Maybe. <laughs> the second one was exercise. That'll change your stomach. Maybe. The third was get good rest. Well, that'll change your stomach. Maybe. And then the fourth. Oh, the fourth was the best one. The fourth was consider it could be hormones. Now, friends, we're going to get into this more in just a second, but I was like, this is the great, big, like mysterious answer. It's like, well, if you're eating right and you're exercising, you're sleeping well, then just blame your hormones or go see your doctor and maybe your doctor can do some magic balance your hormones. And obviously, if your hormones are balanced, then your stomach will look how you want it to look. And like I said, I'm going to get more into that in a second. But what I want us to see here is that every one of these articles was focused on if you don't like your stomach, you should change your stomach. Just like, you know, if you don't like your kitchen, change your kitchen. If you don't like your dog, change your dog. I don't know. It just felt weird because none of them seem to address the issue from the mind or the heart. I mean, the reality is supermodels don't like their bodies. Taylor Swift says in her Netflix documentary that she's discontent with her body a lot, that she's struggled. Carrie Underwood, the same. Like I could list for you model after actress after celebrity who's not content with their body. And you could probably look at their body and look at those specific body parts maybe that you are obsessed with and, and think, oh, if I had her stomach, if I had her legs, oh, then I'd never complain again. And yet she's complaining. Friends, body image issues aren't about our bodies. And so when we say we hate our stomachs or we hate our legs or we hate, you know, our butts, right? What we're really struggling with is something much deeper. We're struggling with how we feel about our bodies. We're struggling with how we see ourselves. And that is in part a mental struggle, and we're going to talk about what that mental struggle looks like in a second, but it's also a spiritual struggle. So today, as we talk about what to do if you hate your stomach, I want to give you just three remembers, okay? The first remember is remember your God. And so like I hinted at the beginning from that Philippians 319 verse, right? The scripture reads, their destruction their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. Now, the context of this scripture is Paul talking to the church at Philippi, telling them to set their minds above. He's telling them to get their eyes off earthly things. In fact, early in the chapter, he talks about his own resume and how he's not going to boast and who he is. He's not going to boast in the flesh in any way. He's only boasting in Christ, right? And so like I said, this, the word stomach or belly in this verse is better translated as appetite, right? They are driven by their appetites. But I think this applies here, right? Because when we observe Obsess over a body part, it changes our appetites. Now, I don't mean physical appetite, although if you are obsessing over your stomach, it could be affecting your appetite in that you could be fueling some sort of eating disorder or disordered eating by trying not to eat certain foods or not to eat very much at all so that your stomach stays a size that you like or that your stomach stays deflated and flatter and that makes you feel more comfortable. And friends, that's that's all part of disordered eating and body dysmorphic disorder, disorder which we're going to talk about in just a second. But more so, I want us to think about the reality of allowing a body part that we don't like, or ones that we like even, but 
allowing a body part to be our God, little G God? Do we allow body parts to control how we feel about ourselves that day? Now, I've had many clients that like I said, obsessed over stomachs, and they'd wake up in the morning and kind of feel their stomach and decide how the day was going to be based on whether or not their stomach felt good or felt bloated or, you know, whether or not they liked the feel of their stomach. Lots of people who have stomach obsession issues are body checkers where throughout the day they are feeling their stomach constantly trying to assess if it's the same size or if it's grown or if it's shrunk, right? And that's almost like a comforting um, device or like a security blanket kind of thing where they keep checking to make sure they're okay by checking their stomach. But friends, can feeling a flat stomach truly make us okay? Does that truly make us safe? Does that truly help us (laughs) give us value or worth? don't think it does. But when we give a body part that we're obsessing over that much power in our lives, I wonder if we are making it an idol, if we are making it that little G God. And so my first tip for you today is remember your God. Your God is not your stomach. Your God is not your thighs. Your God is not your your chest, your butt, your hair, your nose. Your God is not a body part that you need to shape and mold into a certain image so that you can feel more confident. Like I said, you can shape into that image and you still might not feel more confident but that's the wrong God. It's the wrong goal. It is, as that Philippians verse says, it is setting our minds on earthly things. Don't let how you feel about your stomach dictate how you feel about yourself or your life or your ability to live out God's purpose in your life. My second point for you today is to remember your season. Okay. So my friend, If you just had a baby, your stomach may not be what it used to be. Or if you're pregnant, your stomach is going to look different. There are different seasons throughout our lives. Our bodies keep changing. And I get so aggravated by culture that tells us that our bodies shouldn't change or that we should fight the signs of aging or that you can fight what happens after pregnancy and just make everything bounce back. Some can and some can't in the same way. So like I mentioned earlier, I'm in a season of life which is called perimenopause. Now, I never really heard of perimenopause before. Honestly, I had heard of menopause and I just had used that word to kind of characterize everything that happens around the change of life. But perimenopause is actually the season of several years before the point in time when you reach menopause. So menopause is just like the exact day that you can say you've not had a period for 12 months. Everything before that is perimenopause and everything after that is post-menopause. Well, in perimenopause, it's very normal for women to gain weight around their middle. And as I know from all the Instagram ads I've been getting, because I think they know how old I am, every message I'm receiving is, oh, you better fight that. Oh, it's not healthy to have that change happen. Like, oh, make sure you do these things to keep your stomach from showing these signs of aging. But friends, I wonder if that's not a distorted reality, right? Because now think about it. At puberty, 11, 12, 13, you start going through puberty, Your body changes. Why? Because of hormones. Hormone changes change the shape of our bodies. So why would it not be normal that at 45, 50, 52, 53, I think the average age is is between 45 and 52, but some experience it earlier. Why would it not be normal for hormones to cause body change? Now, here's the other interesting thing I learned. The reason why our bodies change and we kind of start shifting our weight towards the middle, that's about estrogen. 
So estrogen is a protective hormone. It keeps our bones strong. It keeps our hearts strong. It helps us in a lot of ways. And estrogen is what starts to plummet during perimenopause. And what happens is when estrogen goes down, our cholesterol goes up. And I think there's some, I'm not a doctor, but something about that is supposed to be trying to protect your heart, right? So everyone freaks out. My cholesterol went up 20 points. And my doctor is like, yeah, that's what happens when your estrogen drops. Let's just give it a couple years and see what happens. But perimenopause, we are losing estrogen and our body is protecting those vital organs and actually storing estrogen in the belly fat, right? So you gain that extra around your middle to help protect you as you go through the change of life. In fact, I listened to this podcast. It's not a Christian podcast, but it was really helpful as the woman interview talked about, you know, just the shame and the stigma around gaining extra weight and fat in your belly at this time of life. And she talked about how the reality is that storing that extra estrogen actually can help us with the symptoms of menopause. Now, what happens for most is we start to freak out, right? Oh no, my stomach doesn't look like it used to look. Like, oh no, I'm gaining right around the middle. And then we hear all these messages from diet culture that gaining right around the middle is a death sentence. And so we start maybe restricting foods. There's actually um, menopause onset of a lot of different eating disorders because women start restricting and trying to eat less and really controlling their food because they're stressed over the way their stomachs look. And what happens then is the restriction of food, really when you don't eat, get enough calories or when you exercise too much, your estrogen drops even lower. So at this time where you already don't have enough estrogen, you are hurting estrogen project. Pro- production even more. And what's happening is the symptoms of menopause can get even worse because we are fighting our bodies. And so I just wonder, why can't we consider our season? Why isn't it okay for a woman to change shape as she enters her 50s? I mean, all the ads are telling us it's not okay. But if you just pause and think about reality, which is our next <laughs> our next point, think about the reality that most women you know, you can kind of tell how old they are based on their shape. Now, that's a broad generalization, right? Women come in all different shapes and we all age kind of differently. But for the most part, women that are going through menopause tend to have more around the middle. And women on the other side of menopause start to lose that and kind of shrink all over. And women in their 20s and 30s don't tend to have more around the middle. Now, that doesn't have anything to do with what body shape you are. But but just the signs of aging are consistent as you look across the population. So it's just something to consider. Consider your season. Maybe you're nowhere close to perimenopause. But friend, the same truth applies to you, right? Maybe your season is just you are busy. You've got toddlers and babies and working out is no longer something you can do for hours a day like you used to before kids. And I'm not saying that was healthy. <laughs> okay. But but consider your season. What is most important in your life should not be the shape of your stomach, right? God has given you people. He's given you purpose, right? Those are the things that we need to invest our time, our money, our attention, our effort into <sighs> changing our stomachs. That's not a pursuit that's going to last because if you are a decade or two away from that perimenopause I talked about, guess what, my friend, you might achieve changing your stomach right now and that might last you for the summer. But someday, someday, either through pregnancy, babies or menopause, it may change. And you'll wonder if all of that investing you did to get your abs to look a certain way for that season was worth it. 
Okay, my third point. So we're remembering your God, you're remembering your season. My third point is remember reality, right? So I hear, I just, I want to dig into some of the science. This is National Eating Disorder Awareness Week. Last year, I did a whole episode where I talked about how I had an eating disorder and I didn't actually know that I had an eating disorder. Um, And so I explain all that in an episode and I'll put the link to that episode in the show notes. But what I want to talk about today is body dysmorphic disorder. Okay. So reality is that some of us that struggle with obsessing over a certain body part do have this kind of issue. It's mental illness, mental, you know, health diagnosis, whatever you want to call it. And and let me put a disclaimer here. This isn't medical device. This isn't a substitute for talking to a licensed therapist or a medical professional, right? Like getting information from a podcast is not the way to diagnose yourself. Okay. But I do want to tell you what I know about this because it's important that if you meet some of these criteria, you at least think about getting some help. So BDD or body dysmorphic disorder is the diagnosis that comes when you hate a specific body part and that hatred, that obsession starts to interrupt your regular life. There's a preoccupation with slight perceived flaws and they categorize this preoccupation as thinking about these defects in your body for at least one hour cumulatively a day. So throughout the day, if you add it up, all the minutes you think about your stomach or your legs, it adds up to an hour or more. Now, I can tell you straight up, although I never received this diagnosis from a counselor, I didn't know I had BDD. I'm quite certain I spend an hour a day thinking about my thighs. Now, here's the other thing you need to know. This only counts as BDD if it's a flaw that is not noticeable to everyone. Now, this is a little yicky. Like, I don't really like the way it's worded in the DSM because in some ways it kind of supports like cultural beauty standards here. But but the better way to explain this is if there's something about your body that's noticeable to everyone and you obsess over it, that's actually something else. That's other specified obsessive compulsive and related disorders that is not body dysmorphic disorder. You only have BDD if you are constantly obsessing, and this includes like body checking and other compulsive behaviors around that body flaw. You only have BDD if this is something that only you notice. So if other people are saying, why are you worrying about your stomach? Why are you thinking about your legs? You probably, well, I'm not diagnosing you, but you could be um, in that category of BDD if you meet some of, or really it's probably all of those, um, those, those requirements. Now, here's the other thing. BDD is related to eating disorders directly, right? So if you're obsessing over your stomach, like we talked about before, maybe you're worried about what you're eating. You don't want your stomach to stick out. You don't like how your stomach feels when it's full of food. And if this is you, my friend, um, pause right now, like get some help. Do not suffer with this any longer. I've got a whole list of non-diet dietitians, eating disorder counselors. I can encourage you to go to great Christian women that can help you with this, but please know that you do not have to live with this. This is not just normal girl life. These are issues that need your attention and your help. Remembering reality, our third point here, includes understanding that you may have a mental health issue that requires you to get some help. And that's okay. But you may have heard that definition of body dysmorphic disorder and been like, yeah, Heather, that's not me at all. (laughs) Maybe it's because everyone would recognize your stomach as a quote unquote flaw. That's probably where I'm at right now. Or maybe it's just because you're like, yeah, it bothers me, but I would never spend an hour a day obsessing over it. Although, you know, I do try to work out and I think about it a lot, but but probably not to that criteria. So then my encouragement for you, my friend, is to just recognize reality, right? Our bodies come in different sizes and shapes. I have many friends here in Texas that have Hispanic heritage, right? And they're more naturally apple-shaped. They carry weight in their midsection, 
I'm more than some of my friends who are African-American who tend to carry their weight a little lower. And then I've got white friends that are apple-shaped and pear-shaped, and some would say they're rectangles or watermelons, or they don't know what shape they are, right? Like we come in different sizes. And I'm afraid that the reason why we get hung up on certain body parts like our stomachs is because of comparison. We're looking at someone else's shape or size of this particular body part, and we're believing this lie that my body part should be the same as their body part. I used to tell this story about how God spoke to me clearly in church one time from the King James versions of of the Bible, and we were in Exodus, we were looking at the Ten Commandments. And in the Ten Commandments, in the King James Version, one of the commandments reads, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's ass. And God spoke to me right then and there. J-Lo was like really hot at that time. And so pictures of her booty were everywhere. And God spoke to me that coveting my neighbor's booty was coveting, right? Wanting a body part that looked like hers is covetousness right? Comparison is a really nice word, a friendly word, like, oh, shucks, I shouldn't do that. But truthfully, friends, if we've crossed into covetousness and we're coveting other people's stomachs or other people's legs, right? We've crossed into sin that Jesus had to die for, right? So so if you've crossed into covetousness, I just encourage you, pause right now and say, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I've been coveting other people's stomachs. I'm sorry that I see her flat abs and I want them and I want that for me. That's covetousness. That's denying that God is good to us. It's denying his grace in our lives and saying, oh, he's better to her or he's better to her because look at her body, Right. It's denying how he made us. Coveting is not what God wants for us. It's it's a sin far, far more commonly uh, mentioned in the New Testament than sin, any sin of gluttony, which would have anything to do with overeating. And I'm going to do a whole episode on how I think that's not actually biblically accurate at some point, right? But covetousness will get us in trouble. That's what causes division in our relationships. And that's really what is the spiritual root behind obsessing over a body part. The only reason we obsess over a body part is because we believe this lie that the body part should look better. It should look more like her body part. And we want it to look better. We want it to look more like that. But God is not boring right? He's way too creative to have made us all look the same. We're all different size. We're all different shapes. Think about going to the zoo. What if all the animals were the exact same? Like, wouldn't that just be weird? And it'd be pretty boring too. Like that would not be a very fun zoo experience. So friends, today I leave you with these three points. If you're obsessing over your stomach, (laughs) The way to fix it is not reading the articles and trying to change what your stomach looks like. Because the truth is, when you're chasing that idol, it will never be enough. You can change your stomach. And like I said, your stomach can change to a different shape and form just because of aging or different stage of life, right? Reality is that our bodies change and our bodies are created differently. And it's only covetousness, comparison, and ideals that keep us stuck in this fantasy land where maybe we believe the last point of those articles where, okay, it's all hormonal and I can just go to my doctor and I can find the magic cocktail of hormones that will fix it all for me. Friends, I've had clients that have done that and actually come out worse on the other side because they started taking all these hormones to fix a perceived flaw and and things actually got quote unquote worse for them. Their bodies changed in ways that they weren't happy with, right? So so hormones, they, I don't know, they could be your answer, right? But they may not. So you need an answer that's meatier. You need an answer that's grounded and rooted in truth. So I'm going to read our scripture for you just one more time. And I'll read it from the English Standard Version like I did before. It says, Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame. 
with minds set on earthly things. Friend, today I want to leave you this encouragement. Set your mind on things above. If you're obsessing over your stomach, stop navel gazing and look up, look around. Scripture doesn't demand that we love our bodies. Scripture commands that we love others and we love Jesus. The freedom is in self-forgetfulness. When you stop obsessing over your stomach is when you can feel free to live in your purpose in Jesus. That's when you'll forget about your stomach. That's when you'll stop thinking about those thighs. When you can feel alive in Christ and what he has made you to do, what he has put you on this planet for that's where the freedom comes, not through getting the abs of your dreams. Well, I hope this has encouraged you today. Check out the show notes for the links I mentioned. And hey, if you like this show, go to lifeaudio.com. There are great podcasts there. There's podcasts on just about every topic you can imagine from great Christian authors and Christian podcast hosts. So go check it out, lifeaudio.com. But I am glad you were here today, and I hope something in today's show has helped you stop comparing and start living. Bye-bye. Before you go, if something from today's show blessed you, may I ask a huge favor? Leave a review on your favorite platform. Seeing your five-star reviews is a huge encouragement to me. Not sure how to do it? You can go to compare to who.me slash podcast, scroll to the bottom, and you'll find all the information. And while you're at compare to who.me, check out some of the more than 500 articles on there about body image, comparison, all the things you're thinking about. Plus, you can find out more about my books, or you can grab a time for a free 10 minute call to see if coaching is right for you. I'm so honored to be a part of your journey out of body image and comparison frustration. And I can't wait to hear how God is working to set you free.